Hello, good evening ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Nick Nickam. Welcome to Triple N Cardiology Lectures. Today we are going to learn about heart failure from basics to bedside management. It is going to be highly focused upon how to deal with heart failure patients at bedside based on the basic knowledge that we need to understand to get optimal results when we treat patients with heart failure. So let us begin. No matter what kind of heart disease you have, be it coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, hypertension, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, uh, congenital heart disease or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, eventually all these roads lead to either systolic or diastolic heart failure. So we need to have a basic understanding of uh, the pathogenesis, the pathophysiology and clinical presentations of both systolic and diastolic heart failure. So we know how to approach these patients when we see them in the emergency room, in the intensive care unit or on a regular telemetry unit. All right, let us continue it. Here in the United States, in the adult population, the most common cause of heart failure is coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, ischemia, cardiac dilatation, congestive cardiomyopathy, and that is the typical presentation, majority of them. However, it can also be related to other conditions. It, we can have valvular heart disease or even conduction disturbances, slow heart rate or ventricular pacing related or pacemaker related heart failure or tachyarrhythmia related heart failures. Those are all some of the things that are connected to the electrical system of the heart. And when we look at other conditions that can cause heart failure, they can be broadly categorized into the systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and this is what is going to be seen in these patients with the dilated cardiomyopathy, thinning of the ventricular wall, increase in diameter, reduced contractility, pulmonary congestion, pulmonary hypertension, fluid retention and symptoms of shortness of breath, weakness, fatigue, edema, weight gain, loss of appetite, all the things that go together. On the contrary, we can have patients with the hypertension or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or infiltrative cardiomyopathy who can have a diastolic heart failure. Uh, think of diastolic heart failure as failure of the left ventricle to relax normally. Let me give you a demonstration of how the ventricle works. And here's a normal ventricle, quick systole, quick diastole, quick Systole, systole, diastole, systole, diastole. In a patient with congestive cardiomyopathy, the heart is just going like this. You can barely see it moving. This is like 10% ejection fraction. In a diastolic heart failure, it contracts normally, but it relaxes slowly. And it cannot, because of the increased thickness, because of infiltration between the myocardial fibers, because of deposition of amyloid or hemosiderin, the heart contracts normally, but it relaxes slowly, sluggish. See? So those are the two main differences between the systolic and the diastolic heart failure. Another thing you want to keep in mind as to why patients develop a flash pulmonary edema in the presence of a diastolic heart failure is because the ventricles cannot expand. So they cannot accommodate any extra volume. They cannot accommodate tachyarrhythmias or atrial fibrillation where you have loss of atrial kick and this immediately go into pulmonary edema. And by the same token, when we control the heart rate, when we control the volume, when we reduce the fluid congestion, their heart failure bounces back to normal quickly in patients with diastolic heart failures. So these are some of the, the important differences that we need to know because this has a significant implication on how we manage patients at the bedside. All right, systolic heart failure can be categorized into stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, based on the New, New York Heart Association classification, which is uh, based on the symptomatology. With the diastolic heart failure, you have only like grade one, grade two, or grade three diastolic heart failure, 
or diastolic dysfunction as it is said which is basically an echocardiographic uh, diagnosis. All right, let's talk about whenever a patient is admitted to the hospital, you have to understand they are not just coming for chronic heart failure management. We need to imprint this in our minds because if you put chronic heart failure, you are going to get a letter from the case managers because nobody gets admitted to the hospital for chronic stable heart failure, be it systolic or diastolic. So basically you have to say acute on chronic heart failure. Now the question is what created this acute decompensation? That's where you as a doctor come to diagnose the cause for an acute decompensation in a chronic heart failure patient in a chronic heart failure patient. It could be related to salt indiscrimination. Patient is not taking medications. Patient has developed new cardiac arrhythmias or the patient uh, having kidney problem. The patient has an infection or blood loss. Any number of these things can put a stable heart failure patient into a uh, acute decompensation. And if you don't establish the cause for acute decompensation, you will not be treating the underlying cause as a result when you just symptomatically treat them with diuretics and adjustment of heart medications. If it's related to arrhythmia or if it's related to blood loss, they are going to come back with the same problem within a month. Hospital readmission for heart failure is around like 24 to 26% across the entire country. It doesn't matter how sophisticated the hospital is, the readmission rates are exceedingly high and our main purpose is to keep the heart failure admissions to a minimum during the course of a year, improve their quality of life and use drugs which may hopefully prolong their life not only drugs, but also devices like ICD or LVAD, things like that. In addition to the reduced ejection fraction heart failure and the preserved ejection heart failure, we also have right heart failure. Right heart failure happens in the presence of a chronic congestive heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where there is chronic elevation of the venous pressure, leading to vascular changes in the pulmonary bed, causing first reversible pulmonary hypertension and in the late stages, fixed pulmonary hypertension. And that needs to be differentiated from pulmonary hypertension happening due to patients having severe COPD or primary pulmonary hypertension or they have other conditions in the lung like fibrosis that could be accounting for pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is a reflection of what is happening in the lungs either from the left heart or from the lung tissue itself. So the right heart failure treatment is going to be a little different but we are going to be limited as to what we can do for patients with primarily right heart failure. We'll talk about that. Again, we're going to focus on the diagnosis of acute decompensation. I'll take care of that one and readjust the medicines for chronic heart failure symptoms. Okay, as I told you, the systolic heart failure or the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is divided into class 1 to class 4. The best way to remember this is class 1, no limitation of physical activities. Class 4, moribund, bedridden, symptoms at, nest, at rest, at night, PND, orthopnea, all these things. Class 2 and class 3 are patients with mild symptoms and patients with moderate symptoms. So that's the way to remember. In class 3, it is further divided into class 3A and class 3B. Class 3A, there's no dyspnea at rest, whereas class 3B, patients have dyspnea at rest. So if you're having a patient lying in bed, having dyspnea, and he's having difficulty breathing, that is class 3B. If the patient is having dyspnea on exertion, mild exertion, like walking to the restroom or to the mailbox, that is class 3A. All right, 
you got it now let's move on okay how do we start treatment on these patients with uh, heart failure that depends upon the class in which stage at which these patients have heart failure if it's a stage one the choice of drugs are going to be different compared to a patient with the stage 3a or stage 3b so if we are dealing with a patient with minimal symptoms or no symptoms for example a young person with a 40 to 45 percent ejection fraction you start them off with maybe a diuretic or add a little ACE inhibitor or A or B if they are hypertensive and as you progress uh, then you add the beta blockers and when you get to stage 3 you add aldosterone antagonists and when you get to stage 3B or 4 you think about uh, hydralazine and nitrates especially in the black population and when you get to stage 4 there are other modalities like devices which we'll talk about that might help to prolong the life. Heart failure is not an isolated event. It is associated with multiple other underlying conditions like coronary artery disease or renal failure or diabetes, peripheral arterial disease and they also have effects on other organs like kidney function. So this is a sort of an interplay among various organs which one leads to the other in terms of worsening condition. Let's move on to, this is a little big complicated slide, that's what it looks like, but don't worry. When we are in stage one, step one, we start them off with a diuretic or an ACE inhibitor. And as their condition progresses, if they have going into stage two or three, then you look into adding aldosterone antagonists like aldactone. If they have a class two or three heart failure, and if they have adequate blood pressure, they can be started with A's or ARBs, and if that doesn't work, uh, they can be tried on uh, ORNIs, or direct renin inhibitors. If you are dealing with class three or four, uh, if it's a black population, you can try hydralazin and nitrates, which have been shown to reduce mortality. And again, if you are dealing with uh, a reduced ejection fraction of 35% or less on maximum medical treatment, uh, you can consider an ICD in these patients to prolong their life. If you are dealing with class 3 to 4 with the ejection fraction less than 35 and has a left bundle branch block or a QRS duration of uh, greater than 140 milliseconds, uh, a cardiac resynchronization therapy may be in order to help these patients get the optimal cardiac output and again if you are dealing with if you are dealing with class 3 or 4 heart failure with a heart rate greater than 70 you can use eva burden which maintains the sinus rate at a lower le rate like less than 80 which helps to optimize the cardiac function when all these measures uh, fail to reach, reach fail to reach a desirable effect then we should consider palliative therapy or work up this patient for transplant or a left ventricular assist device and maybe some investigational drugs if they are going to <coughs> if they are going to be helped all right let's continue with this how good are these drugs in reducing the mortality? How good are they in improving the quality of life? Those are the important uh, endpoints that we should be focusing upon. So let's look at here. A's or A or B's reduce the mortality by 17%. That's pretty good. They also reduce the rehospitalization by 31%. So that is a significant number. So all patients with class 2 or greater heart failure uh, New, York heart, uh, New York Heart Association heart failure need to be on A's or A or B's. Now let's look at beta blockers. The beta blockers which we'll be talking about will be metoprolol and carvedilol. They reduce mortality by 34% in patients with heart failure. So that's a remarkable improvement in prolonging the life and also improving the quality of life. And they also reduce hospitalization by 41%. So if you have a patient with class 
stage 2 heart failure or stage 3 heart failure if they are not on beta blockers there better be some very good reason as to why they are not receiving beta blockers beta blockers are very well tolerated even if their blood pressure is like 85 millimeters systolic but we need to adjust other medications to make sure that we get these patients on beta blockers maybe back off on diuretics maybe back off on other blood pressure medicines to make sure that these patients are on beta blockers. Aldosterone antagonists such as uh, aldactone or aprilarone, they reduce mortality by 30% and hospitalization by 35%. And look at this, hydralazine and nitrates, which was tried to be very useful in, in the black population with a 43% reduction in mortality and a 33% reduction in hospitalizations. So these four categories of drugs are an important ornamentarium in managing patients with heart failure and every effort should be made to get the patients on these medications based upon their New York Heart Association classification, based upon their symptoms and based upon their background. Let's talk a little bit about diastolic heart failure. In the original image, I showed you the problem with the diastolic heart failure is relaxation. It contracts good, it relaxes slowly because of the stiffness of the heart muscle. So we don't have a whole lot of treatment for diastolic heart failure. The treatment of diastolic heart failure is the treatment for the precipitating causes like volume overload worsening kidney function or increased salt intake which increases intravascular volume which the left ventricular cavity which is small cannot handle it and as a result they developed pulmonary edema. Similarly arrhythmias create a same effect especially if they go into atrial fibrillation they can quickly develop uh, pulmonary edema because they lost the atrial kick so the ventricular filling is uh, compromised as a result the fluid backs up into the lungs causing flash pulmonary edema and when you diurese these patients they respond very quickly and they bounce back uh, much faster than patients with chronic systolic heart failure with blood pressure in the 80s patient having weakness arrhythmias and all these things which make it more challenging in a systolic heart failure patient. In patients with diastolic heart failure, the most important thing is to control their systolic and blood pressure, diastolic blood pressures. Diuretics may be used when they have volume overload. Their volume overload may not be as obvious as we see in patients with systolic heart failure. Patients with systolic heart failure can come with 30 pound fluid overload and they could still be walking whereas a patient with diastolic heart failure if they just have a liter or two liters of excess fluid they can be in severe respiratory distress like all the other things like coronary revascularization management of atrial fibrillation and use of ACE inhibitors they all play a role but they do not significantly change the outcome but nonetheless they need to be instituted because they have a class 2a indication and it has been shown that nutritional supplementation is not going to alter a diastolic heart failure outcome now let's talk about the drugs used in uh, patients with heart failure. I'm not going to go in depth about the drugs that are used as far as their dosages, side effects and uh, adverse reactions and all these things. I'm going to talk about the principle of what drug do we use, where do we use it and under what context do we use them. So we have the diuretics. Of course, you're not going to be using hydrochlorothiazide for a patient with systolic heart failure because of their compromised renal function. The diuretics that we're going to be using will be Lasix, ranging from 20 milligrams to 240 milligrams, uh, either orally or intravenously. If they don't respond to Lasix, we can use Bumax, which is like uh, uh, one milligram equal to 40 milligrams of Lasix, something like that, then it can be given intravenously so we get a better response in some patients with heart failure. Torsamide is the same way, which is also a, a diuretic, which works sometimes better than Lasix. Diamox is used in patients with chronic respiratory alkalosis, 
where there is excess bicarb, you like to neutralize that with the dimox, which is an acid. Of course, metalazone is a sort of a loop diuretic where a combination of Lasix and metalazone is very powerful. It helps to get rid of extra fluid in patients who have been resistant to Lasix. And you add that in a dose ranging from 2.5 to 10 milligrams per day. Aldactone, we talked about aldactone study, which showed a better than 30% improvement in mortality. Aldactone is used generally in class 3 or 4 heart failure patients. ACE and we talked about the ACE inhibitors or ARBs. I would say just learn one or two drugs in each class. In that way, you know exactly how this drug works in various ethnic groups and what kind of side effects do you expect. So you're more familiar with than trying to learn 10 different drugs because you're getting lunch from 10 different uh, pharmaceutical companies, but that's not going to do any good for you or your patients and your staff because it's very hard to keep track of uh, 10 different drugs in each category. Look at how many drugs we have here. So I would say stick to lisinopril or whatever drug you like. We use lisinopril. It can be from 5 milligrams to 40 milligrams daily, in preferably twice daily dose. Same thing with losartan, 25 to 100 milligrams per day. It can be given twice daily for a better control of symptoms. Then you have uh, valsartan, and we also have entresto. Entresto is a drug which is uh, one of the new drugs associated with. This is a new drug associated with uh, improved quality of life and. Uh, that's something you can add if they don't respond to conventional drugs. Of course, we have nitroglycerin uh, for acute situations, but if we are dealing with an ischemic patient, then we can use long-acting nitroglycerin like Isodil or Imdur, ranging from 30 to 120 milligrams once daily. Hydralazine and nitrates are used in combination, especially in patients with a class 3 heart failure in the black population. And I talked about beta blockers, should, which should be the mainstay of every patient with heart failure stage 2 and beyond to improve their uh, mortality and to reduce their recurrent hospital admissions. Correct, ranging in dosages from 3.125 milligrams twice daily all the way up to 80 milligrams sustained release uh, Correct or Curvedalol. Metaprolol, the doses ranges from 12.5 milligrams every six hours. If it's a tartrate or if it's a succinate, you can give it once a day. I generally like to give them twice a day so you get a steady serum level throughout the day. Going to the inotropes, this is going into the intensive care unit at bedside. Those who are having chronic systolic heart failure, who are already receiving these medications but still come with fluid overload, then dobutamine, dopamine, mildrinone may be useful. Digoxin is usually used in patients with uh, heart failure, especially if they have atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response and you have maxed on your beta blockers and you don't have any other choice because of reduced ejection fraction. Digoxin can be used as a short-term drug or it can be used as a long-term drug as long as we keep the digoxin level one or below. And when you go into class four heart failure, when all these treatments have failed, the options to consider revascularization if the patient has ischemic heart disease or CRT, which is a cardiac resynchronization treatment if they have prolonged QRS interval of greater than 140 milliseconds and an ICD, which has been shown to improve mortality by almost 30% in the first year in patients with uh, ejection fractions less than 30%. LVAD is a sort of a bridge in most cases to transplant, but it can itself uh, help to get symptom relief for patients in class four heart failure. All right, see, whatever drug we use, whatever treatment modality we consider, we need to think about the alternatives, the less dangerous drugs. Anytime you choose a drug A, B, C, or D, we need to look at the, look at the benefits and harms. So every drug that you're going to use, write down one contraindication which you need to watch. Then add the second contraindication. 
or add a third contraindication if you use a combination of this drug with something else. For example, if you are using beta blockers, if the patient has a high grade AB block, you better not use a beta blocker. So in that case, you may have to be careful about what drugs to use in place of beta blockers. Similarly, if the patient's creatinine jumps from one to three, you want to back off on ACE inhibitors until the creatinine stabilizes. So there is a contraindication and there's a serious side effect related to practically every heart failure drug. So I would put that one first before I put down the indication for a given drug. In that way, if the patient potassium is 5.6, you don't want to start that patient on aldactone. You see what I mean? If a patient has severe ischemic heart disease with ischemic changes on the electrocardiogram, you need to be careful about using hydralazine, which can aggravate ischemic events in patients with coronary artery disease. Okay, enough of preaching. Let's look at some cases here. This is a 57-year-old male with mild hypertension, recent inferior myocardial infarction, blood pressure 150 over 95, ejection fraction 40%, and creatinine is normal. All right, okay, here we are dealing with a young person with a recent myocardial infarction and a low ejection fraction. The blood pressure is still high, so what are we going to treat this? Is this class one or is this class four heart failure? So this is class one heart failure and the blood pressure is high, so we have some room to manipulate, to adjust the ACE inhibitors so that we can optimize the functions. So in this patient, you would choose or increase the dosage of your uh, ACE or ARBs. If this patient is not on lipid lowering drugs, I would check the lipid levels and start them on statin and closely monitor the kidney function, the weight and the blood pressure and also symptoms. So that's, uh, that's how you approach because every treatment uh, for the, Every treatment has to be tailor-made to that given particular situation at that moment. The treatment may be different tomorrow for the same patient. The treatment may be different six months down the line, but we are focusing on at that moment. That is an important distinction that we need to keep in mind when we are dealing with the patients with heart failure, especially systolic heart failure. All right. So... We already have this. Let's go look at another patient here. 67 years old, male with hypertension. 67 year old, male with hypertension. 38% ejection fraction. Shortness of breath with mild exertion. Leg edema, weight gain. Now we have a different scenario here. The patient is hypertensive. He's got mild uh, symptoms. This is like class three. Class three, maybe A. And he has gained 20 pound weight. So we are dealing with a totally different situation altogether here. First of all, they need to be treated with diuretics, strong intravenous diuretics. Now get rid of the fluid overload. Look for what precipitated this heart failure. Let's go into the treatment chart here. So we're gonna start off with the intravenous diuretic to get rid of the weight and bring their weight to the baseline. We're also going to get this patient on A's or A or B's. This patient definitely needs to be on beta blockers and then he doesn't need inotropes at this stage. We also need to look at uh, if the blood pressure is not well controlled, we may have to add another drug which could be something uh, like uh, a calcium channel blocker, but his ejection fraction is less than 40%, so you would like to avoid a calcium channel blocker. If the blood pressure was very high, then you could use uh, a, an alpha blocker like clonidine, which does not depress the left ventricular function. So this is how you approach a patient uh, based on their clinical presentation, based on their pre-existing medical conditions, uh, uh, so that your treatment is highly, highly focused to that patient for the current symptoms while looking for what precipitated the heart failure, the chronic heart failure to begin with. Okay, let's look at one more patient here. This is a 74 years old male, hypertension, anterior MI, LV ejection fraction 30%, shortness of breath with minimal exertion, edema, weight gain, stopped medicines. Okay, now we are talking at, uh, this is not class one heart failure. This is not class four heart failure. This is class three. So this is class three B heart failure. So first we optimize 
the heart failure symptoms get rid of the fluids look for the secondary causes like arrhythmia ischemia infection anemia renal failure and all the things we talked about and when you fix all these things and you optimize the medical treatment for 3 months if the ejection fraction still remains 30% or lower then you may have to consider either a CRT on along with the CRT maybe an ICD depending upon the ejection fraction the EKG and the overall condition of the patient so this is how you approach uh, each patient differently based upon their underlying medical conditions based upon their stable cardiac function and based upon how what brought on the acute decompensation okay you can look through this one and make your own decision and uh, we will uh, Ladies and gentlemen this is a very quick overview of uh, systolic and diastolic heart failure from the cradle to the crisis situation in a class 4 heart failure who is on LVAD waiting for transplant i hope you have learned something from this uh, where you have I hope you have learned something from this presentation which you can apply in your clinical practice at bedside with the information that you have from this presentation. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. I am Dr. Nick Nickam and please please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch uh, over 150 videos we have on cardiovascular lectures. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.